In today's lecture, we're going to talk about gene interaction. Whenever we have genes interacting together in the same pathway, it's something we call epistasis. And there's different types of epistasis. Uh, in general, epistasis means that the alleles of one gene can mask expression of the alleles of another gene. We'll talk about the how in a second. But the different types we're going to talk about today are recessive epistasis, dominant epistasis, and then duplicate recessive epistasis. Let's look at the first one, recessive epistasis. Recessive ep epistasis is when you have um, two um, recessive alleles in one gene and they mask expression of the other gene. So let's show you an example. Let's say we have a dog and there's two genes that uh, affect fur color in the dog. So the first gene, B, uh, has two alleles. There's a big B that encodes for dark fur and then there's a little b that encodes for brown fur. So big B is more black fur, little b is brown fur. So you can see when you compare these two dogs, the dog on the top has big B, and then the underscore means it doesn't matter if it's a big B or a little b, which makes sense, because if the big B is dominant to the little b, it doesn't matter if the other allele is a big B or a little b anyway. But so big B, again, if you have one copy of that at least, it encodes for black fur, that's why the top dog is black. If you have two recessive alleles, little b, little b, it encodes for brown fur, and that's why the dog on the bottom has brown fur. The other allele that we have, though, is E, and you'll notice that if you have a big E, at least one big E, that's dominant, and that encodes for correct pigment deposition. In other words, the pigment can travel where it's supposed to travel. If you have two little e's, uh, so it's homozygous recessive for, uh, for, um, for pigment deposition, uh, which you don't see yet, but um, what that would be is that the pigment does not travel the way it's supposed to travel, and so it does not deposit. So even if it's made, it doesn't really matter, because if it's a little e, little e, it's not traveling to where it should go. So if we look at a few more phenotypes here, you can see that these bottom two phenotypes, the dogs have very light fur, so almost like a very, very light yellow. Uh, and you might say, well, why is this? Well, again, because look at their second gene. Look at the E gene. You can see that the E gene, there's two little e's, in both of these genotypes. So they're saying that no matter what the color is going to be, it's almost as if you don't even look at the B. No matter what the color is going to be, it doesn't matter. Because you can see that the pigment's not depositing where it should. So this genotype here should be what? It should be black, but it's not going to be. This should be brown, but it's not gonna be. So in this case, we would say that the E gene is epistatic to the B gene. And this changes our phenotypic ratio. We're used to seeing a very standard 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 uh, phenotypic ratio in the F2 generation. You can see instead now we would have a 9 to 3 to 4 because these last two categories would collapse and we would see dogs that would have uh, this yellowish fur. There's real examples of recessive epistasis happening in humans and a great analogy, a great example is in the ABO gr uh, blood groups. So. Um, You've uh, learned previously that if an individual uh, has uh, A blood, they're either AA or AO. If they have B blood, then they're either B, B or BO. If they have O blood, then they're not having any, um, any terminal sugars uh, on their red blood cells. Uh, so we could say they're OO. And so you could see that um, these are the antigens that are associated with different blood types. So terminal sugar, that's an A terminal sugar, that's a B, and then lack of a terminal sugar is O. But if you back up, there's another gene in the problem we haven't talked about yet that you need to know about. And this gene is something called compound H. Uh, actually, it's, excuse me, the, the compound is called compound H. The gene is the H gene. And so what this is, is before any terminal sugar to be added, period, you have to have compound H added to these uh, polysaccharides on the surface of the red blood cells. And so you can see that to have this compound H added as a precursor to any type of blood group, what you need is at least one dominant allele or one big H. And so you can see that once you have big H, doesn't matter what the other allele is, you're gonna get this compound H that enables either a red antigen, a B antigen, or nothing to be added. So basically then the blood groups are what they quote should be. However, there's individuals that um, have a phenotype that we refer to as the Bombay phenotype. And you could see that if they have the Bombay phenotype, they're little h, little h, uh, which means that uh, they're homozygous recessive for that, and they cannot produce compound h. They're not producing it. 
So if they're not producing compound H, it doesn't matter what their blood type should have been, whether it's A or B or O, they're all going to appear O. So this is an example of recessive epistasis. We would say the H gene is epistatic to the ABO uh, blood gene. There's other examples too. Uh, another example is something called dominant epistasis. And what this is, is uh, when you have dominant epistasis, you have uh, one large letter or one dominant allele of one gene that masks the other gene. And so this is a simple example uh, with different uh, types of vegetation where you could see that the vegetation starts with a, a white appearance, uh, something called enzyme one. This is a very general diagram, obviously. We're not saying the names of the enzymes, just that they're enzyme one, enzyme two, but you know, it's enough detail to get the idea. So we have compound A that's white, Enzyme 1 converts it to compound B. Enzyme 2 uh, converts it to compound C. But you can see that here, we're not going to pass this enzyme 1 area. In other words, enzyme 1 is not going to be made correctly if there's a big W here. And so it's going to inhibit that allele. It's going to inhibit, uh, inhibit the uh, conversion of compound A to compound B. And so we're never going to progress past that. The fact that you have one allele here, one dominant allele that that is epistatic to, uh, to the other gene, to this Y gene, so we never get there, right? Uh, that's called dominant epistasis. Another type of epistasis is basically the same type of thing as recessive epistasis, but it's called duplicate recessive epistasis. In other words, uh, before it was directional. We were saying in the dog example, if you're little e, little e, that is epistatic to the B gene. Well. Imagine that uh, what if each gene, the homozygous recessive version you know, of, of, um, of that genotype was epistatic to the other gene. In other words, it went uh, bi-directional, went both ways. This is duplicate recessive epistasis. So here you can see that you have compound A, you have a shell that's white. Compound B, sh shell is still white. Compound C, then this shell gets this sort of colored, darkened appearance. And again, enzyme 1, enzyme 2 progresses the pigments through those pathways. Well, if you have a big A or a big B, if that's your genotype, you can progress through those pathways because you're making enzyme 1 correctly. However, if you have little a, little a, or little b, little b, each of these is going to inhibit either enzyme 1 or enzyme 2 respectively, and you're never going to go from compound A to compound B to compound C. And so... What that means is you're always going to have these shells that have these white colors. Other things I'd like to discuss today are uh, something called um, sex-limited characteristics. And this is something where you have two individuals that have the exact same genotype. So let's say we cross these individuals, we get these offspring you see at the bottom here, these F1. You can see that we have males that are big P, little p. Uh, or little p, little p, and then females that are the exact same genotypes. So again, big P, little p, or little p, little p. And the females, both of these females undergo uh, normal puberty. In other words, puberty at the normal time. However, when you have uh, males that have little p, little p, they undergo normal puberty. But big P, little p, they undergo something called precocious puberty or early puberty. Uh, they're the same genotype as the female, but you only see that you get preco precocious uh, puberty or early puberty in the males. The fact that the same genotype is only expressed in a male but not in a female is called uh, sex limited. There's also sex influence. Uh, sex influenced is where it occurs more in one sex than the other. Uh, an example of sex influence would be something like uh, body hair in humans. So uh, females and males might have the same genotype, uh, you know, for the different genes affecting body hair production but males produce more body hair than females. So females have some, you know, hair on their arms, uh, hair on their legs, but not as much as males. So that would be sex influence, where it's not all or one, but you know, uh, one sex produces more of the phenotype than the other. There's other types of uh, things that are called temperature sensitive alleles. So if you look at these two flies on this diagram, they have the exact same genotype, but you can see that the fly on the left has very shriveled wings, the, uh, you know, perhaps miniature, miniature or vestigial looking, uh, and the fly on the right has normal wings. The only difference between those flies is the temperature uh, that was available during their embryonic development. Uh, the genotypes are exactly the same. So you can see that the environment affects expression of genes, and these are called temp temperature sensitive alleles.